true great songs. They're acknowledging the faithfulness of God and, and crying out to him to do what only he can do and come and revive the land. We all know that we can share the gospel and we should share the gospel. We must share the gospel or be found, I think it's uh, Spurgeon that says we are, we are all either missionaries or hypocrites. Uh, but only the Lord can make it effectual. Only he can apply it to the hearts of sinners. Only he can open sinners' hearts. And so we, never, we must never forget that we cry out, Lord, shine the light. Shine the light. I'm reminded of, of Pilgrim's Progress when uh, when evangelist encounters a Christian, the, the pilgrim, the main character in the, in the story, and Christian is he's just weighted down by this awful burden of the reality of his sin, and evangelist is pointing him the way, and he said, do you see yonder wicked gate? The wicked gate meaning, meaning small gate. Do you see the small gate in the distance? And Christian says, no, I don't see the gate. He says, do you see yonder light? Do you see the light in the distance? He said, I think I see the light. He said, then walk toward the light until you see the gate. And that's really good advice for any, any uh, person seeking the Lord. Walk toward the light. Act with the light that you have until, until the gate is opened unto you and you enter into life eternal. Well, we're looking at this uh, following Jesus day by day, examining the gospel, different gospel accounts that show us, that hold up for us the, the uh, approach that Jesus took. The, he's the consummate disciple maker. We talked to you about, about phases. Come and see the first phase and then come and follow me where we are now and then the second phase and then come and be with me. We're about to transition to that. Come and be with me. And then the final phase, remain in me, of course, after he has, after he's gone. Remain in me. And so I want to look tonight at the fourth installment of Disciple Making Phase 2, Come and Follow Me, uh, from Mark 2, verses 18 to 27. We might, we might touch on the early part of chapter 3 to, to uh, show some, uh, make a, an example, a point. Uh, but if you stand with me as I read through this portion of Scripture, I'd appreciate it. Mark 2, 18 to 27. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We can, all, we can all be subject to and blinded by some of the things that blinded the Pharisees. Jesus would open our eyes, would show us uh, the value of, of making new cloth, not trying to patch up the old, of developing new wineskins to carry the new wine that he was bringing in, in the gospel. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, someone has said that the that the only constant in life is change. And we've, most of us here, many of us have lived long enough to testify to the truth of that. Jesus comes to bring change. Now, 
we can experience change. One, one, one person is observed, and, and change, by the way, often brings growth, depending on how we respond to it. We can experience that, the, the growth and change through troubles and trials, uh, or we can experience it by stepping out on faith to simply believe what Jesus teaches in the Word and praying the Holy Spirit will help us by faith to, to apply that. And that was what Jesus was calling his followers to, and that's what he calls us to today, is to take him at his word, step out on faith, and, and believe that his way is the best way. One, one writer has said that uh, when you study Jesus, you seem to get the impression that he, he's, his example was that reaching out and encountering trouble is better than sitting around and waiting for it. And of course, we know through the Gospels now that he had no shortage of encounters and troubling encounters with the Pharisees. We looked at that this morning with, with, uh, in the last week with the Sadducees and this morning his encounter with the, with the scribe. We have just read here uh, in Mark 2.22 this, this teaching of his that needs to stick out to us tonight. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. That's the metaphor he uses to introduce the kind of ministry he has. It's going to be, it's going to be new. It's going to be different. It's not going to follow uh, the traditions uh, of the Pharisees and of the Sanhedrin, which, of course, was uh, what troubled them so greatly. Well, one of the things that that he did not follow their script. And they, they confront him about this. And so in this passage, what, you, what I want you to see tonight is how Jesus really takes this to them. He takes his teaching to them. He, he does something. Uh, he models for them a message he wants them to understand. Now, tradition is not a bad word, okay? In fact, we probably could spend part of the evening just sharing some of, the, some of the traditions that you and your family have around Christmas or Thanksgiving. They're, they're, they can be good things because they can enhance family. They can, they can invoke memory. Uh, they can create community uh, and, and really be a blessing to all who participate in them. But when tradition is, is simply, uh, what is it? What is it? Uh, the seven last words of the church, we've never done it that way before, or we've always done it that way. So that can be deadening. That can be uh, uh, hindering. And this is what Jesus was up against. And so Jesus is going to show them that relationship building, uh, touching the down and out, matters more than fitting somebody's preconceived mold uh, for what they think things ought to be. Look with me just, just briefly tonight. Look at verse uh, 16, if you would. And see, he's, he's encountered these folks. You want to back up a little bit. Beginning in verse 15, he, he reclined at table in his house Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. He's, uh, he's at the home of, of Levi, the son of Alphaeus. And the scribes and the Pharisees, by the way, just let me say, have you noticed as we read these that they always seem to know what he's doing? They're following him around. They're, they're, they're reporting. It's, well, why, does he, why does he do this? You know, we saw him go in there. I mean, they've, they've always got spies out to see what he's doing just interesting to me that that, that that was the way that they operated. And they say, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And of course, we've, we've showed you this in another setting that Jesus said, well, those who are well, remember now, Jesus doesn't think anyone is by nature well, but he's going to grant them their, their position. Those who are well, as you think you are, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, and you, you really believe these tax collectors and sinners are, they're sick people, not sick in terms of needing medical attention, but they're just sick. They're sick in their lifestyle. And I came not to call the righteous, 
which again, you think that you are, but sinners, which you've said that these folks are. And so he's, he's going to, for the sake of making a point, grant them their argument. Not granting the truth of it, but turning their argument on them. What else would you expect me to do? To hang around with all those who are well while people perish who are not well? And so, so this, is the, this is their encounter here. This sets up... Uh, we looked at the law this morning. Jesus answered that. And I need to tell you that the Pharisees, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago when we looked at the Sadducees. I gave you a con contrast comparison. The Pharisees were those the guardians of the law. Guardians of the, of the Old Testament as they had it. The law and the prophets and the writings. Uh, they were sticklers about it. So much so that Jesus will say to them at one point in Matthew's Gospel, he says, you know, you, I notice you tithe mint. You know what? How is mint manifested? It's in little stalks and leaves, right? Mint leaves about that big. You tithe mint, that was a spice, and cumin. Have you ever thought about what it is like? What it would, you know, we have mint that grows right outside our door. The challenge you would have to tithe your mint leaves. The first thing you got to do is you got. If you mean it, you got to count it. You got to count the leaves. And say, so, okay, I've got I've got here 37 leaves. I need to tithe 3.7. I'll be generous. I'll tithe four. I mean, that's the mentality you've got to have. And Jesus said, that's what you do. You tithe your mint and your cumin, and you do well. You you should you should do that. But you leave weightier matters undone, and that was his charge against him. He did not seem to resent their, their fastidious approach to trying to be honorable to the law. What he resented was that becoming an end in itself for them. C.S. Lewis said, heresy is the truth taken too far. That's an interesting definition of, of heresy. I think there are other definitions out there. But see, for, for these, these religious leaders, these guardians of the law, for Jesus to eat and drink with the, with the outcasts of society caused an outrage among them. Richly unclean people. They hadn't gone through the necessary steps to, to perform uh, the ceremony of, of becoming ceremonially clean and, and, and worthy of being in the presence of a rabbi. Jesus sets a new path. He offended them. The disciples said to him at one point in his ministry, <coughs> you've offended the Pharisee. You remember Jesus' response? Let them be offended. Let them be offended. He did not come to fit in to the established religious mold. Now, he kept the whole law. He never broke one syllable of the law. He fulfilled it in himself. And so Jesus said this of them, just, just citing in Matthew 11, uh, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. <clears throat> Son of man came eating and drinking, and they say here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The problem with both of those men, John the Baptist and Jesus, was they did not bother to fit into the established mold. And so he chides them about this, this, this matter. One writer, as I was looking at this this past week, said that the fatal mistake of the Pharisees of putting, protecting their ways over reaching, touching, hurting lives can happen in the church today if we're not careful. And he goes on to say this. I thought this was interesting. We have mistakenly identified the unbeliever as the enemy rather than the victim of the enemy. So if we're not careful, we'll erect unnecessary barriers between ourselves and the very ones we, that we pray that we would reach. And if we look closely, very often these barriers can be cultural and not necessarily theological. 
we're not careful, we'll send a message to the world. And I think, I think there's enough folks that have done this. I'm not suggesting we do, but there's enough folks that have done this that identify as Christians that this is the message the world gets. If you practice certain activities, you are not welcome in the Christian community. And I've talked to you before about this. There was a study done that for, for people who are not churched, not plugged in. What's one word that comes to your mind when you think of Christian? And the one word was judgmental. You see, we've got to find a way to uh, refuse to condone practices without condemning. And the only way I know to do that is to walk the gospel path. I think some people have made huge mistakes, given up huge ground in condoning uh, some, of the, some of the new morality, which is not morality, it's immorality. We've, we should never feel the need to condone or wink at that. But we must come up with a way, and it's the gospel way, to, to refuse to condone without condemning the non-Christian for practices that we disagree with, particularly those that won't necessarily keep them out of heaven. Jesus would not commend those who are drunkards and, and gluttons, but a drunkard, a glutton, can repent and be helped. Jesus never would have approved of adultery, but he certainly uh, was found reaching out to an adulteress, a woman caught in adultery. So what drove Jesus, now think about this, what drove the, what drove the Pharisees was to protect the religion at all costs. What drove Jesus was to show compassion to those who need a touch from God. And so we must, we must check ourselves and say, how do, I, how do I look at the world? How do I look at the unconverted around me? Wherever, however they manifest themselves. And we've talked about this before. Have, have I been cut off, unwittingly cut off from the unconverted? So that no one would ever accuse me of eating with sinners. Because I don't eat with them. Remember, come and see. Come, come see where I worship. Come see where I live. Come, come sit down at my table. And we've got to recover. We've got to look on the lost as victims. Who need compassion. And not as the enemy. Out to destroy Christianity. Even if some worldviews seem bent on destroying Christianity. Truth of the matter is they can't do it, folks. They can't do it. If this whole nation enacts laws that turn against us as Christians and we go through a season that we've never known this country and that is to be without religious liberty, you know what will happen? The gospel will flourish. It will not die in that. It will flourish in that. It flourishes everywhere else in the world where intense persecution is brought against the church. You do realize there are more Muslims being brought to Christ now than at any time in history. And I would submit to you that perhaps since the, the Crusades and then, and then uh, and some time later, uh, it's been a long time since the persecution of Christians has been so intense at the hands of Muslims. And we've got to recognize that some of, the, some of the most open people we're going to encounter in whose lives God has created a hunger for the gospel, may well do things and have habits that we find repugnant and we find offensive. And I'm not suggesting that what I'm about to say is for everybody, but we've got to, we've got to as we mature as disciples, realize that, that I may be the one God's calling to wade into this. The maturing disciple, not the novice, not the babe in Christ, the maturing disciple has got to be willing to enter into an arena where people may have a smoking habit, they may curse, they may tell jokes that, that are offensive and not appropriate. You've got to realize, and I was going to bring tonight, and I couldn't, I couldn't find one of my own. I think we got rid of all of them in a the garage. So I was going to bring a, a rod and reel and stand here and cast it to, the, to that front pew. And 
let you do that for a few minutes and let you look and think, what's he doing? Well, I'm fishing. You feel, I'm fishing, yeah, I'm fishing, I'm fishing. And, and you think immediately, Joe's part of a, of a bass club. He thinks immediately. You're not going to catch any fish there. Why? Because the fish aren't there on the front pew. And you wouldn't think Joe was a very good fisherman if you passed his house and he was sitting in his boat and he was casting out into his yard. He wouldn't. <laughs> For practice, maybe. You see the point, though? Jesus went and he was teaching his disciples. That's the point of come and follow me. He was teaching them to go where the fish are. Now, I'm, I don't know anything about this Pokemon Go <laughs> madness that's sweeping the country. But I'm learning. And here's why I'm learning. Uh, some folks have told me that they've encountered people that you would never get to encounter engaged in that. Uh, not to mention that, that gamers who typically just sit zombied out in front of tubes are now walking. They're actually getting out of walking, which it can't be bad. Uh, and I, and I want to know, I, I want to know how, how can I get a Pokemon point or whatever it's called here? I want people in groups to walk up outside here looking for whatever these things. I, have, I know nothing about it. I mean, if, if, I've, already, I've already spoken beyond what I know. But if you, if you pay attention, there are people walking around in groups and that's what they're doing. Have you seen them? I've seen them here in Owasso. Josh said he saw several groups on the way to Claremore the other day. It seems bizarre, but what, what if? What if a pokey point here at our facility uh, gives an opportunity to, to connect with somebody, to talk with somebody, who's uh, to offer a hot, sweaty Pokemon Go participant uh, a bottle of water? What if you're out and about and encounter a group and you can converse with them about, and again, I don't know, what, I'm way beyond what Pokemon character they found or are hunting or however this thing works. But I want to look into it because it's a connection point. It's, it's a social media connection point. And it's way outside my comfort zone. You've got to know that. Way outside. But what if it introduces me to people? But I can get a, begin to build a bridge. Jesus went where the fish were. And I think that's so important to remember. One, one pastor, I think it's uh, Bill Hall, was, who wrote the, the book on this, was talking about an experience he had where, where he played on an, an, an inner, uh, some sort of inner a city league baseball, a basketball uh, league. And so they were going to a tournament and traveling uh, for part of the weekend. And he said he went, and, and the guys confessed to him later, said, we were so afraid that you were going to like make us read our Bible. He knew he was a pastor. Make us read our Bibles, and, and uh, we had to go to church. I mean, all these things. And he said, I didn't do any of that. I just tried to befriend them. He said, on the way back from that, he said, I found myself sitting with about eight men around me asking me things about the Lord. Does that happen every time? No. But there's a, there's a principle here that if we will meet people where they are and let them get, get close enough to them to get an aroma of Christ, that it may well draw them out. Because see, what the world expects is for us to condemn non-Christians. And what we've got, got to become as fishers of men is people who, who recognize non-Christians are going to act like what? non-Christians. They're going to act like unconverted people. And particularly in a culture that, I didn't get to develop this this morning, but I've developed it in time past, preaching on the Ten Commandments. In a culture that's lost the, 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 the underpinning of moral law. There's no moral code predominant now. We don't have it at the highest levels of, of, of leadership in this country. And so when the, when the moral code is gone, then who determines what's right and what's wrong? Reports are coming out now that a 29-year-old 
black man whose birthday was today, decided to celebrate his birthday by killing three policemen. A fourth is hanging on for his life uh, in the Baton Rouge area, and they're, and they're not just the police, but the sheriff's department. How do you, how do you come there except you have no moral code, no sense of right and wrong? We've got to avoid the temptation that, that, that I think Jesus is, and we're going to get into the text here in a minute, but of, of hunkering down in rabbit holes. Yes, it's going to wax worse and worse. But folks, we win. We've already won. Paul says in Romans 8, in all these things we are, not we will be, we are more than conquerors. Super conquerors is the Greek word there. To him who loved us. And so we go forth with, with our battle cry. We sang about that recently. Our battle cry is the love of God, the love of Christ. God loves us and we, we want to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus ministered with both feet in the world. He put himself in a position to be misunderstood but got close enough to sinners to have an impact on them. Remember Jesus prayed for us in the high priestly prayer, John 17, verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus intended for us to continue living here touching people. And so, our text. John's disciples, verse 18, Pharisees were fasting. People came to Jesus. They were spying on him. Why do John's disciples and disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? You need to know that fasting, if, if you ask, what, what does the Old Testament teach about fasting? Not, not what it is, but in terms of, is there a commandment? And on one day a year, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the people of God were commanded to fast. One day a year. Now, to give you an idea of how creative the, the Pharisees were, they established as part of their tradition that Mondays and Thursdays were to be days of fasting. Mondays and Thursdays. And Thursday, if you, if you read some material on this, you'll discover Thursday was one of, the, one of the great market days where they would go into the markets to shop. And so you know what the Pharisees would do? Jesus chides them for this. They would go in, we're fasting. Fasting today. Would you like a sample? No, no samples for me. I'm fasting. And make a big show of it. Can you imagine doing that at Sam's? Would you like to taste this? No, fasting today. Thank you, though. It totally betrays the whole notion, the practice of fasting. And so Jesus does something very interesting in his response. They ask him, why do your disciples not fast? Well, in all likelihood, I would imagine that you would find them on the, on the dawn of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they probably did fast. Jesus said to them in verse 19, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? In other words, have you ever been to a... To a now what's he citing? He's citing a tradition. A good tradition. Wedding feasts at weddings. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. They'll... Uh, as part of fasting is, is a grieving over the situation. Why don't they fast? Jesus says, well, why, why should they fast? Uh, have you ever been to a wedding reception where people fasted? No, oh, I am here. That's why they don't fast. I am the bridegroom. I have come. And I'm with them. And it's a time to celebrate that I'm here. I'm going away. I'm going to be gone. He, it's clearly he's talking about himself. They knew that. It's a day coming when it will be appropriate to fast, but it's not appropriate to fast when, when, their, when their heartfelt prayers for the coming of Messiah have been answered in me. This is a time to celebrate, 
to feast. So he begins to expose their the shallowness, the emptiness, the, the wrong-headedness and the wrong emphasis of their traditions. We mentioned to you last week that, that Jesus keeps before these disciples the basics. We talked about the basics last week. He keeps before them the basics of, of Scripture reading and, and teaching from the Scripture, of prayer, of fellowship, I mean real communion, and witnessing, and then the fifth of worshiping. And we saw, we saw the five of those last week in the passage we studied. And they are the basics. And he's continuing to impress upon them that this is how my disciples are to grow and to live. And you cannot, you cannot witness by extracting yourself from the culture. We, can, we might practice witnessing with one another as, as we are believers and, and, and hone that, that capacity to, to have an increased comfortability to communicate the gospel to a situation. You don't, I don't think a canned approach is the way to go, but, but you can get enough of a basic outline in your mind. And when we, when we did our faith evangelism training here, we pointed out you can enter in at any point of that. You don't have to go, you don't have to spell out faith. You can enter in at every, any point to speak to a person considering where they are, what they have brought up, what you've heard them say, and find entrance to speak the gospel. They need to find us hopeful. Our bridegroom is returning. I, I'm, I'm as bewildered as you are about how people can just be so cold-blooded. But the scripture told us it would happen. The love of many will go, grow very, very cold. But it's just bewildering to me. It's bewildering that we don't have leadership that will step in and stop it. But that doesn't mean we need to be hopeless. We should be hopeful. We don't need to be giddy and superficial and lighthearted about it, but we should be hopeful. We should speak to people and say, you know, my hope for what's happening in our country is built on something altogether different. I have a Savior, a risen Savior. And so we've got to make the main thing the main thing. I think that's what Jesus was showing uh, his disciples that they should emphasize, emphasize prayer, Bible study, witnessing, uh, fellowship, and worship. And that needs to be the emphasis here. We've got, we've got challenges, stewardships, responsibilities. We're going to have an open forum next week to discuss uh, building needs that we have, and we should do that because we need to be good stewards of the facility God's let us have and let us, let us meet in. But that don't all flow out of a love for the Word of God, a high priority on the Word of God, a love and valuing of prayer, valuing of fellowship with one, koinonia with one another. We're going to spend eternity together. We ought to, we ought to get together and get to know one another. We're going to spend eternity with one another. And fellowship in the Lord. Encourage and mutually encourage one another. Witnessing, sharing the gospel, and worship. Jesus Jesus emphasized that. And by the way, those all flow out of internal attitudes, heart changes, sanctification, which is the, the consummate change. I've been around long enough to know the difference in somebody, and I don't always know it initially, by the way, but time is the great leveler. Time's a great unmasker. Of someone who's, who's on, on the ride for religious reasons, and someone who's had a saving encounter with Jesus Christ. There's a difference. And it shows up. My friend R.F. Gates used to say, Bill, it's the difference of taking uh, corpses and, and dressing them up and putting, putting rouge and powder on them to make them look alive and setting them in the seat and you, and you watch them and you, and you want to be hopeful and they start slumping over. It's, it's that difference in, in life. Someone who's come to life. Legalism emphasizes external behavior. Christianity emphasizes internal attitudes that flow out into actions. And so we come back to our text. This notion of, uh, of the verse 21, 22. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. In other words, you can't, you can't patch 
religion. There are people who try to do that, and you, you can't patch religion. Because it's, it's incompatible with vital Christianity. It may, it may have been the, 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 the context the, the, for, from which Christianity can rise, but you don't, you don't try to meld the two. Any more than you would pour, and you, you understand that people who, who sow and who wash, and, and I don't understand this, but I know people who do, people who sow and put patches on things. And I do remember this, however, that my mother used to patch my jeans. I, it seemed like every pair of jeans I had had holes in the knees. Not when I bought them, but not too long after I had them, they developed holes in the knees. And my mother would patch them. Now, we didn't know then that that was, that was the way you're supposed to wear jeans with holes all in them. But back then, a good pair of jeans was a pair that had no holes in it. And she would take a, a, a patch from another piece of cloth, some denim or something, and sew over it. Sometimes she'd sew it on the outside. Sometimes she'd sew it on the inside. Uh, I always thought it looked kind of goofy on the outside, but she was a seamstress. I wasn't, so I wore what I had to wear. But when you washed them, it, it didn't hold up. They would, they'd come apart. I didn't think about what the significance of that was, but that's what Jesus is talking about here. It may look okay for a season, but put it to the test of a, of a, of a washer. And I think we had, a, we had out in, the, in our uh, garage an old ringer washer. I think. And it'll come apart. But the second example I think is more obvious to, to many of us. Uh, not because we know a lot about wine, I don't know anything, but because you can see the visual. That you don't take new wine, fresh wine, which you, which you know breathes and expands, and pour it into an old wine skin, which is going to have to expand, and it may overexpand and burst and rupture. And so when it does that, you've lost the wine. You've lost its contents. And Jesus uses these two examples to show the difference between what he has come to do I'm, I used to be a big Kenny Rogers fan. Uh, and he had a song one time, You Decorated My Life. And I listened and I thought, you know, that's what I think that's what some people act like in Christianity. Like Jesus came in and just kind of rearranged and spruced up. No, he didn't, he didn't decorate my life. Uh, he, uh, Martin Luther said, the law first wounds that it might heal. The, the law kills that it might make alive. He, uh, Paul said about, he was alive apart from the law one time. And then the commandment came, you shall not covet, and sin revived, and I died. Paul, Paul was, was slain as Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, and he was made alive in the Spirit. Jesus came to give us a new life. If, if anyone is in Christ, Ephesians teaches, we are what? New creations. We're not made over. And Jesus has come to establish this kind of kingdom, this kingdom of, of, of new creations, this kingdom of, of one new man of the two, Paul speaks of in Ephesians. Powerful message for the day in which we live. The Pharisees, regarding the old cloth, regarding the old wineskins, and mistakenly thinking you could patch the one and put fresh wine in the other. And Jesus said you can't do either. So as he's teaching them about the, the emptiness and the fallacy of their traditions, he then goes a little further. Verse 23, on the Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, again, they're following, they got their spies, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he cites the Old Testament, have you not read? And again, I told you, when you, when you say to a Pharisee, have you not read? You might as well say, you are so ignorant and stupid. That's what they heard. Have you not read? You didn't know this was in your Old Testament. What David did when he and his, his men, uh, his warriors were famished, they were in need, Hungry, he and those who were with him, he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest. And he ate the bread of the presence, that, that show bread is called, which was designated only for the priest to consume. 
And he gave it also, he ate it. The king, okay, well, you might, okay, the king ate it. No, he gave it to those who were with him. Common soldiers. And we said this, and we studied this when we first began going through Mark. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That was, uh, we don't see that so much again today because you don't, you don't encounter pockets and communities so much who are that rigid and that, that fixed on Sabbath. I think I told you when we went through this early in Mark uh, that a friend of mine, he since passed away, I uh, was, was serving as a pastor in a church in the Northeast, and I went up there for a conference one time, and they were, real, they were tightly wound on this whole, on the Fourth Commandment and, and the perpetuity of the Fourth Commandment. Reactionary somewhat to those in other Reformed and Baptistic circles that were, that were trying to do away with the Fourth Commandment, the, the Sabbath Commandment. And so I was staying at their home, and uh, one afternoon, it was Sunday afternoon, we'd eaten lunch, and he and his wife went to take a nap and left me in the, in the den, and I leaned back in a recliner and uh, looked down, and there was the newspaper. There was the local newspaper, the Sunday paper, in fact. So I picked it up to just kind of see what the headlines were. I, I didn't read. I set it back down. Well, later on that evening, we got back from the, from the conference that evening. He said to me, I'm going to ask you something. I said, what? He said, did I see you? Well, again, he was spying on me. He was supposed to be in his bedroom napping, but he was looking out of his bedroom apparently and saw me pick up the paper. Did I see you pick up the paper and read it today? And I said, yeah, I picked up the paper and, and looked at it, and he said, well, we don't do that, brother. That's, that's a violation of the Sabbath principle. And I, I was caught back off guard, very honestly. <laughs> and I, but I, I, the only thing I knew to say was, well, then why did you leave it as a, as a point of temptation for me to, to yield the temptation? Mean, why did you do that? Why would you? If, you, if, you, if you think that highly of it. So there are people around that are really tightly wound about this, folks. I want you to know that. You don't see them so much today. But this, is, this, is a, this was a snapshot of the whole Pharisaic mentality. You've stepped outside the bounds that we have established. And so they're going to they're gonna chide Jesus because his disciples on the Sabbath are walking through the grain fields. Now, look, they could have walked through the grain fields any other day of the week and plucked grain and it would have been considered harvesting. But you don't harvest on the Sabbath. That was the mentality operating here. And so Jesus just turns their own scriptures on them and says, that David did this. And he comes down with the principle, and we, we developed this when we looked through Mark uh, chapter 2 the first time. The Sabbath was made for man. God created the whole Sabbath institution when he rested on the, on the seventh day. And it's in the commandment. For six days the Lord God made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and honored it. It's a day in which, in which you are called upon to rest. Folks, we are such time-bound driven creatures that if God had not commanded us to stop one day a week, we would never stop. We would go, go, go. I mean, look, just be honest. For some of us, it's hard enough to stop on that day. God was speaking that for our good. Walter Shantry's book, I commended at the time, I commended again, called The Sabbath of Delight. Uh, C-H-A-N-T-R-Y is how you spell his last name. It's a tremendous work on this very principle. That is for our good. God did not create the Sabbath as a tool to use to manipulate and control religious people. And that's how the Pharisees used it. And so he, he cites this powerful principle. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So here's, here's what he's saying. That human need takes precedence over human law. God is concerned about the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And so we'll just mention this, and we're going we're to wrap this up. If you read on into Mark 3, that's where he encounters he, uh, a man uh, with a withered hand uh, in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And this one, when you read it, you know that Jesus just decided, I'm about to teach an object lesson here that's going to tick some people off. Because when he healed him, in the sight of everyone there, there was a stern, angry response to that. And he said to them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? 
Because in Jesus' mindset, when we, when we fail to do good, we have, if not actively engaged in evil, we have granted evil. We have allowed evil. We have participated by, by being, a, being an observer, a spectator in evil. If we have not done that uh, to save life, then we have allowed the killing of life. That's, and by the way, that, that is not, that has come straight out of the commandments. I told you when we went through the Ten Commandments, and I don't expect you to remember this seven, eight years ago, but I told you then that every commandment, whether it's stated positively or negatively, every commandment has, a, has duties enjoined, things we are to do, and sins forbidden. And when the Sixth Commandment teaches you shall not kill, it teaches also, that's, that's, the, that's the sins forbidden, those, those things that have to do with taking human life. It also teaches that we shall do all that we can to protect our own lives and the lives of others. Every commandment is like that. And Jesus is, is pushing that when he asks these questions. They should have known. That the forbidding of evil meant, meant the insistence on doing good. And this, this man had needs. He had help. And yet they were content to let a man waste away in their midst in the name of protecting the institution of the Sabbath. And so, so here's, I found this in reading. I think this, this fellow, Jesus said essentially to them, I will move toward human need regardless of your obsession with tradition and your misunderstanding of God's law. Because a right understanding of God's law, God's law calls us to compassion. A right understanding of you shall not steal calls us to, to respect private property and the possessions of others. The commandment says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor calls us to to uphold and honor the truth and stand in the defense of the truth and speak the truth in a timely way and not speak the truth in an untimely way. It's, all of these things are hammered out in the, in the scripture concerning these commandments. And so we're going to we close with, with these thoughts tonight. I have to ask myself, I challenge you to ask yourself, as Jesus says, come and follow me and will take us where, where the fish are. Do I have any baggage that keeps me from doing that? And I, I shared with you this morning, I didn't develop it a whole lot. But folks, I discovered in me recently, and I mean, I've never thought that I'm totally free of and pure from racial bigotry, but I discovered in me recently some, some real racial uh, stirrings, bigoted stirrings. And it came up over this constant use of white privilege, white privilege. I'm thinking, white privilege? What, what white privilege do I have? That's what I was thinking. And when I saw my pastor friend tremble and almost weep as an African-American pastor, I thought, Bill, you are, you are not plugged in as you should be. This brother is hurting because when, when a police siren goes on behind him, he doesn't know what's going to happen. Josh was telling me about a, one of the supervisors that, that they, he meets with every now and then out of Corpus Christi. And I didn't know till this week that he's a, he's a black man. And that he drives a Mercedes. And was pulled over recently. Was he, was he speeding? Was he, he was speeding. He got pulled over. And the police officer approached the car and said, whose car is this? And he works for PSO, AEP, makes, makes a good living as a supervisor. And he said, it's mine. I mean, but, but you see, I can't imagine anybody here driving a car, getting pulled over by a police officer, who, that that question would be asked of you. Would it? Just wouldn't. And so the Lord smote me about this on a couple of Saturday mornings ago. That 
something. You're, you've got to check your attitude. Oh yeah, people are misusing that term, white privilege, but you have got to be sensitive to brothers and sisters in Christ who are African American, Hispanic and others who, who do not respond. My response when a, when a police siren goes on behind me or lights go on is, oh, I'm nuts. I don't know what I did, but I hope I'm going to get a ticket. That's, that's the beginning and end of it for me. I'm here to tell you, if you don't know it, that's not the response typically of an African American or Hispanic or Native American and so on and so forth. It's just not. So we have got to discover, do, we, do I have any baggage? Am I, am I unwittingly encountering people thinking, well, boy, you, you really need to get to where I am. You really need to, to quit this and quit that and stop that and stop. Or am I meeting them where they are with a life-changing message that they need to see that has changed my life? And the change in my life is not to make me judgmental of them or size them up as the enemy of my gospel. But the change that's come in my life is that it's made me more compassionate for them, more caring for them, more willing to listen to their story, and then, and then at the right time share the story, share what really matters. Do I have baggage? One fellow said, we too often are like a group of sun worshipers heading off to the beach on a warm sunny day dressed in raincoats, rubber, knee-high boots with umbrellas in hand. We're equipped, but not to reach the world, not to fulfill the Great Commission. So when we take heed from what Jesus does is he intentionally showed his followers, these 12 that followed him, how you put meeting of human need above protecting religious traditions. You never give up the gospel. In fact, if anything, the gospel is enhanced when you meet people that way. The world will sit up and take notice when, when the beauty of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus is seen flowing out of his church. We looked at some verses this morning. I'm going to add one to it as we close. Matthew 9, 13. Go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. As we come toward the end of this follow, come and follow me. The disciples are beginning to flex their wings. They've learned about the priority of the Word of God in their ministries. They've seen the priority of prayer. Sometimes you, you leave the crowds to draw aside to be alone with God so that you don't lose your perspective and think you're, you're bigger than you really are. And you witness. Even amid great controversy with, with some perhaps serious results, implications. Can we do that? Converts become established disciples, willing to make disciples when they follow Jesus' example and his, the basics of Christianity. So come and see. Come and follow me. Next, come and be with me. And then finally, remain in me. Don't leave. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we again bow before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our Savior <clears throat> who did something really incredible to take 12 men, one of whom was a devil that he knew would betray him, and pour his life into them for three, three and a half years and equip them and then go and accomplish his mission to die on the cross for sinners to rise from the gate, grave and ascend back on high and leave the future of the church and the advance of the gospel in the hands of these 11. And to see 
how you have breathed on that for 2,000 years through your Holy Spirit. It is astounding. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being in on that and just pray that we will grow as disciples, longing to be disciple makers, living to see the privilege of others becoming disciples through, through our touch, through our words, through our lives, and themselves growing into disciple makers. I pray that you would descend upon this place and stir this spirit in our hearts and lives like never before. I thank you for those who have an interest in this. I thank you for those who are growing, have grown as disciples who really are, are moved even beyond this and pray that you will uh, set, as we sang earlier, set our hearts on fire. Send forth your word and may we be the ones, who, the vehicles who carry your word and cause your light to shine in the darkness because we know this, that no matter how dark it gets around us in this culture, there has never been a culture in the history of the world that's been able to fight back the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ shared in the gospel. Cause your light to shine, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about...